and glory because you're worthy of it and we thank you for this opportunity to praise you this morning in Jesus name amen you may be seated Take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalms, book of Psalms, chapter 27. Kim, if you could turn the volume down a little bit, make me work harder. Otherwise, if I start working harder, it'll really get loud. Do you have a good week? Yeah? Nice weather? Nicer weather coming this coming week? If you thought it was humid last week, you ought to go to Cambodia or Laos, where our kids live. You don't know nothing about humidity until you go over there. It's really, really hot and humid. Hey, before I start this morning, I want to offer a little bit of a disclaimer. Several weeks ago, I preached on the subject, do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? And I left a track out in the uh, lobby afterwards titled A Dialogue About the One True God by Roland uh, Clark. Uh, after getting some more information, uh, I want to tell you that that's not the most reliable track that there is in addressing Muslims about the about the uh, nature of God, and I apologize for that. I got her off the internet, didn't do all my research by looking at all of the sites and some of the other sites that he recommends, and so I would encourage you, if you have a copy of this tract at home, uh, you can read it through if you want to, but I would not advise you using it with Muslims. There's something else that's on the way that we're going to get that would be a little bit better than that, so forgive me for that. I should have checked out my sources a little bit better. This morning, I want to talk to you again about gazing into the face of God, and I want to address that in more of a practical way, but before we do that, I want to take a look at Psalm 27, and if you just follow along as I read the first several verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. As I'm reading through this, notice the, the problems that David is facing, the, uh, the heartache, the difficulties that he's facing in this passage. Though an army besiege me, verse 3, my heart will not fear, though war break out against me. Even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, some of the translations say, this only will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. So what does it mean to gaze on the beauty of the Lord? Let's keep reading. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling, he will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, this is David saying, to God, seek his face. And then David saying himself, determining, your face, Lord, will I seek. 
It's easy to see when reading this passage that David is in the midst of trouble as he was in much of the time during the days before he became king and even after that. But this one phrase where he talks about this only will I seek and that being to gaze on the beauty of the Lord seems to be the central theme, the rock bottom, um, the, the central thing in his life that he keeps coming back to over and over again in the midst of all his troubles. Did he err at times? He did. He erred badly. But David always seemed to come back to the Lord. And by the end of his life, the Lord makes this assessment of David that he was a friend of God, that he was a man after God's own heart. And we talked about this last week, that when we seek the face of God, when we come to discover the beauty of the Lord, that it, it helps to, to change our emotional chemistry. That when we get sight of God and how big he is and how wonderful he is and how glorious and majestic and, and powerful and beautiful he is, it has the potential of changing us on the inside so that you and I come to realize more clearly that we are made in the image of God and that nothing else in creation, nothing else in creation has the potential of, of displaying the, the beauty of God more than, more than human beings. Nothing else in all creation is made in the image of God. Only people who have been created in his image. And it's not always just Christians. Sometimes even among people who have not come to know Christ, the beauty of God is seen. I was just kind of uh, um, really encouraged this last week. At the end of the NBC national news, there's always something that's a little bit positive. And one of the tragedies that's taken place in one of the communities in our country uh, demonstrated how people from that community banded together and began to help each other. That is part of the image of God that is, that is present within us, whether we're a believer or not. God, God created us, all of us, in his image. Yes, that image has been marred by sin, but when we become believers, we are recreated, we are reborn in his image, and we become more and more and more like him, and we radiate his beauty, just like Moses radiated God's beauty when he went up on the mountain and received the Ten Commandments. So David, at this point in his life, in chapter 27, verse 8, says, says to the Lord, My heart says to you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. It was a deliberate choice on his part. Whether he was facing pain or shame, and he placed, faced plenty of both, that he turned his heart towards the face of God. So your question might be, as my question is, so how do I do that? How, how, do I, how do I gaze upon the face of God? I have no portraits to look at. Nobody took his picture. Even Jesus, we don't have an accurate picture of what he really liked. We have an artist's conception. So how do I face God? How do I... How do I communicate with him? How do I gaze upon his face? Let me suggest that there are at least seven ways, and there are more than this. Uh, authors have written books about this, but there are at least seven ways that you can connect with God's face, connect with the beauty of God. And I have called these seven sacred pathways to God's beauty. Now here again, let me make a disclaimer at the very beginning. I'm not saying that all roads lead to God. I'm not saying that there are many different ways to be saved. That's not what I'm saying at all. There's only one way to be saved, and that's through Jesus Christ. But I am saying that God has so wired us differently that there are different ways that you and I are able to connect with God, different ways devotionally, that we can feel and sense the presence of God. And I want to talk to you a little bit about those today. The first is music. 
You can add worship if you want to, but I'm, I'm thinking primarily just in terms of music. David wrote in the Psalms, I will sing and make music to the Lord. We just read that in verse 6. I looked up the word sing in my concordance online and discovered that the word sing is used over 100 times in the Bible. A song over 78 times, music over 90 times, and the word psalm, if you include the titles of all the psalms, well over 100 times. Psalm 98 verse 4 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth burst into jubilant song with music. Paul wrote, Sing to the Lord in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The Bible tells us that we can clap our hands when we sing, that we can lift our hands, that we can shout to the Lord, that we can dance to the Lord. In fact, David in the Old Testament got in big trouble with his wife when he danced around and it sort of seems like he was just wearing his BVDs. He just, she just got all upset with him, but uh, he, he, was just, he was just praising the Lord. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go out in your fruit of the loom and, and uh, dance around the neighborhood, but I am suggesting that there's nothing wrong with raising your hands or shouting to the Lord or singing out loud to the Lord or clapping to the Lord. All of this very, very difficult for Scandinavians. <laughs> but the Bible is full of music. It's full of music. Heaven is full of music. Even music without words has the capability of affecting our emotions. You say, oh, I don't think that's so. Well, I'll tell you what, I've done this many times. I thought of it again this last week when I was watching a scary scene on television. When you get in the midst of a scary scene on TV where somebody's going through a dark place and there's the possibility of somebody else popping out and shooting at them or whatever, stop and listen to the music that's playing in the background. And then turn off the sound and just watch the picture. You didn't turn off my sound then, did you? I thought it went off for just a second. <laughs> um, music has the capability of making us want to, want to dance or making us want to be afraid or calming us. Look at this picture of uh, somebody who you will recognize. If I were not a physicist, I would probably be a musician. I often think of music I live my daydreams in music. I see my life in terms of music. I get most of my joy in life out of music, Albert Einstein. Music is a, a beautiful way for us to connect with God. I believe that God is a musician. I believe that God can use music as a universal language to draw people to himself. Music is one pathway. Second, nature. Nature. How many of you are nature lovers? I mean, nature lovers. Um, nature is a way that, that we can be drawn to God. I want you to turn to Psalm 19. It's not that far away from our text, our text this morning. And I, I just want to read the first, the first three and a half verses of that passage. First four, four and a half, three and a half. Psalm 19. The heavens, notice the words, notice the words that, uh, that are like speaking, okay? We have a couple of them in this first verse. Declare. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Nature has a way of speaking the character of God. This is why when Paul addressed the Roman church 
and talked about how they had gone away from natural love of a man for a woman to a man loving a man and a woman loving a woman in intimate ways. He says this, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Nature. The, the Bible refers to nature again and again and again as a means of explaining to us, helping us to understand the nature of God. Psalm 23 is a classic example, but the Psalms and the rest of Scripture are filled with these kinds of expressions. Just listen to a few of them. Green pastures, quiet waters, the valley of the shadow of death, trees planted by streams of water, leaves that don't wither, God's righteousness like the highest mountains, hills are clothed with gladness. Nature speaks to us of the very nature of God. Now, there's a caution that I will give with this, along with some of these other ones, and that is that, that people are also a part of God's creation. It is easy for some people to say, well, I don't need to go to church. I can go out and sit under a tree or go take my fishing pole and sit out on the boat in the middle of the lake and think about God. Yes, you can do that, but are you really thinking about God? And have you neglected another important part of your spiritual growth, and that is being with his people? So any one of these particular means of meeting with God is not meant to be exclusive and can become in and of themselves an idol if we don't think of them as a means by which we approach God. One of my favorite authors is Eugene Peterson. Um, and uh, he and his wife, he's been a pastor for a long, long time. He and his wife have regularly during his, I don't know how many years of ministry, taken their day off and gone out. Uh, they, they've lived in places where there's woods and mountains and nice places where you can get out just about any time. And they take, they take their Monday mornings and they go into the woods or into a state park or something and they separate. All they've got is their Bible with them. Um, and she goes one direction, and he goes another direction, and they meet at noon. During that time that they're away from each other, they don't speak to a soul. And when they come back together at noon to have a sack lunch together, they talk about what God has shown them that morning or what they have experienced and felt. And now all of us can't do that. But that's just one example of people using nature in a very constructive way to help them in their pathway towards reaching God's beauty. Uh, Mary Ellen's going to share just a brief testimony about, uh, about this and uh, the two things that I've talked about so far and how these spiritual pathways have been helpful to her. so I don't wander too far. Okay. Uh, three of these of the seven um, are me. And so I'm going to talk about three of them just briefly. Uh, nature, of course, points me to God, the creator. And when I see a blazing sunset, lakes, trees, the beauty of a waterfall, the power of a waterfall, the reflection of the moon glimmering on a lake or the river, and I get up at night, the beauty of a fawn, Domesticated animals, how we love our dogs and cats. And llamas, Kate, right? <laughs> and the strength and beauty of a horse. The, the, all of these just turn you to God. I, I look at God, you know, I just look up and say, wow, what you have made from the tiniest bug to the largest whale. God is so amazing. Clouds, I love clouds. You look up at these big white puffy things floating in the sky. And especially when you're flying at 33,000 feet and you look down at them, you feel like you could jump out and bounce off of them, you know? But of course you can't, but um, just the whole idea of, of clouds. 
Music, music insights worship. I walk with my iPod every, almost every day, and um, I kind of, I, uh, I, I have all praise music and stuff on my iPod, so if you ever catch me walking down the street and I'm singing and I've got my hands raised up like this, you'll know I've got my iPod. I kind of make sure the neighbors aren't out in the yard when I do that. But it's not, it's not about the great music, it's about entering into the presence of the Lord. Music draws us into his presence and leads us to praise and worship him. We keep Christian radio on almost as much as I'm home. Uh, I've got Christian radio on. And that is such a help. Keeps us just tuned in to the Lord all day long. So if you want your kids to grow up um, listening to the right kind of music, have Christian radio on a lot. Buy them the right albums and stuff to listen to. And the third one is the Word of God. You know, um, I have studied parts of the Bible all my life. I've been learning about God since I could talk. And, um, but I did have to admit that here I am, 66 years old. Ooh, did I say that out loud? Ooh. Um, and I have never read the entire Bible through from cover to cover. And I've heard about people that do that. They read the Bible through every year, and I'm like, oh, my word. Um, I was listening to the radio a while back to Haven with Charles Morris, and he had a guy on there who has come up with a 90-day program for reading the Bible through. And so I, I sent a contribution, ordered the book, got my 90-day Bible, and I'm doing it through the summer. I'm on about day 49, and I am loving it, loving it. It, it, you know, it used to be a lot with devotions like, oh, I've got to have my devotions now. Or uh, I'll put it off till later, and then, of course, you don't have it. But I am, I am, every day I'm looking forward to jumping into my reading. And what it's done for me is I'm seeing pictures, or I'm seeing the big picture of the Word of God from creation to revelation. And I'm reading some passages I had never even seen and it's just been amazing. So um, that would be something you might want to try. If you're interested, uh, talk to me, and I'll tell you how to get there. Thank you, honey. The next one is ritual. Ritual. Um, maybe not as popular in our day, but I want you to think back into the Old Testament and how ritual was so much a part of the worship of people in Old Testament times. It was, it was filled with symbolism that helped in drawing people towards the Lord. Washings, fragrances used in temple worship, oil, candles, the table of showbread, both in the tabernacle and in the temple, these were all significant parts of worship. Or think of the Passover with the plate of Passover filled with five or six or seven, I don't remember, different kinds of food that reminded people like with the radish of the, the bitterness of their time in Egypt and other things that were a part of that plate along with the lamb that pictured the coming of the Messiah. Ritual was a very integral part of Old Testament worship. Now, I have this theory. I've not read it anywhere else. It's just my own theory. But my theory is that at the turn of the centuries, after the resurrection of Christ, and in the years that followed, the Catholic Church took on the ritual that was a part of the Old Testament temple and tabernacle. Not all the same, but certainly if you go to a Catholic church into high Catholicism or even high Orthodoxy, Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox, you're going to see lots of candles. You're going to see the swinging of the smoking incense. You're going to see the use of oils and candles and and, and even in our modern time, things like foot washings and candles and incense are, are, are sort of having a rebirth in some churches. My theory is that the Catholic Church borrowed much of their ritual from Old Testament 
temple worship, and that we as Protestants have borrowed most of our way of doing things from the synagogue where there was almost no ritual. It was strictly the preaching of God's word. Now, you can take that for what it's will, and I'm certainly not... I'm certainly not advocating that anybody start using the rosary, or I, I, I'm, not, I'm not advocating idolatry, I'm not advocating icons, but what I am saying is that the Old Testament was filled with ritual, and there are some people that are drawn to those kinds of symbols, and those things help them. I had a, a music pastor that, um, in one of my churches that I think was sort of drawn to ritual. He had a special corner set up in his office where he had a kneeling bench and a, 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 a music stand or something like that where he could put God's word. I don't remember whether he had a candle there or not, but some of those kinds of things are very helpful to some people in their worship. I remember in one of my churches in, I think it was in Iowa where there was, no, it was, it was in Nebraska where there, we had candles for a service. And uh, one of the old saints just had a fit because we had candles. He thought, he thought we were going Episcopalian or something like that. And it was just like, no, we're not going Episcopalian. We're just using a candle to speak of the light of God. So those kinds of symbols are sometimes very helpful to some people in their worship. Here's another one, number four, solitude. Let me read from Mark chapter 6. You don't have to turn to it. Mark chapter 6, then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Solitude, quiet. Solitude, if you've ever practiced it, is, is a place where the scaffolding of your life is removed. No friends to talk to, no calls to make, no iPod or iPhone, no books, no meetings to attend, no music to entertain, nothing to distract you, just you. Vulnerable, weak, naked emotionally, and sinful. It is a place where we learn to ignore the rat race. You and I in our modern day tend to equate activity with spirituality. It is not so. In solitude, we learn to let go of our inner compulsions to win and our frantic effort to attain. A.W. Tozer had an interesting phrase that characterizes the modern day rush of people. He says we are in the current cult of commotion. Solitude involves things like meditation, ruminating as a cow would over his meal, but ruminating over God's word and his character. It may include fasting. It would always include prayer. It has, through the ages, usually been marked by austerity and simplicity. It's geared probably more towards the contemplative type of person than it is to anybody else. Gordon MacDonald calls it a large interior world where the outside is shut out and the inside in communication with God is closed in. Brother Lawrence wrote a book called Practicing the Presence of God. He understood what solitude was all about. I've asked Teresa Nelson if she'd come and sing a song that comes from, I hate to date myself, it comes from the 50s, no, 60s or 70s, I think. Uh, you've probably never heard it, but the title of the song, come on up, is called uh, A Quiet Place.
place. And I'd like you to just listen to the words. We're going to display the words on the screen while she sings. And I just want you to listen to them. Don't sing along. Just listen to her and listen to the words and read them if you need to. Some of you need that. Some of you, some of us, need that. The world that you and I live in increasingly draws away from that. The world that you and I live in knows very little, if anything, about solitude. The world you and I live in is all hustle and bustle. Much of its surface, very little of it deep. We need solitude. The fifth is service. There are some people who are just, they seem to be born caregivers. They connect with God by serving others. There are people who resonate with Jesus when he said, whatever you did for the least of these, you did it for me. It was modeled in the New Testament by a woman named Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. These are people who don't just want to attend church. They're not content in warming a seat. They've got to have a place to serve. Now, there's a caution here. And that is, you need to learn how to receive as well as to give. And you need to not resent people who don't serve as much as you do. And you need to learn not to overextend yourself. And you need to learn not to, or to avoid codependence where you're doing something for somebody else so that you can receive something in return. But the fact of the matter is there are some people who connect with God by connecting with others, by serving them. And in the day and age which you and I have lived in over the last, if you've lived for 50 years, there's probably no better person that has personified this than Mother Teresa. 
she just seems to be the one whose name comes up in the area of, of serving others. I think I've told you before that my son Joel had the opportunity of being in India for at least a month, I think, with the India Children's Choir, traveling with them. And I got, that wasn't it. He traveled with the India Children's Choir on another occasion, but he was in India on a missions trip with the college that he was attending, and he had the opportunity of running into Mother Teresa. He, he sort of wanted to get a picture of himself with her. She's about five foot tall, not much bigger than that. Joel's six, maybe six one, six two. And, uh, but he looked in her eyes and she looked in his eyes and he said there was something about her that made him feel like she could look straight through him. And a photo op was, a selfie was not the thing to do at the time. Sixth is study. Mary Ellen mentioned this. This is loving God with our mind. Uh, love that, that really causes us to dig deep into the scriptures. Let me read a verse out of Proverbs, three verses out of Proverbs. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. My dad, my dad loved to study. I didn't learn it, uh, I didn't learn it specifically until shortly before he died. My dad, because of his engineering background, just was so detailed and kept track of everything. Um, he spent he spent his entire adult life teaching Sunday school, and every week he spent eight hours in preparation for teaching a Sunday school class on top of his 40-hour job and traveling across the country sometimes. Um, there, was, there was a Bible and a Sunday school quarterly on the toilet closet. Um, he would always be reading. And on Saturday, he would, I remember growing up, he would always take a good chunk of Saturday, perhaps all Saturday morning. He'd been working on it all week, but then he'd kind of finally put it all together. He just, he just loved to study God's Word. P people who connect with God by studying His Word are invigorated by learning something new and want to share it with others. Samples of people who who get in touch with God this way in our era are people like J.I. Packer and John Piper and uh, C.S. Lewis, who of course has already passed away. And lastly, another way of connecting with God is through relationships. The Bible says that where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. So there are some people who just they connect with God by being together with other Christian people. Jesus modeled this. Jesus was almost always with his 12 disciples, and on several occasions with just three of them, who were perhaps his closest disciples. These are people whose spiritual moments in life, whose key spiritual moments in life, have usually taken place in the context of, of groups with other believers. And they, they believe strongly in the one another's of the New Testament. Serve one another, love one another, care for one another, build one another up, on and on it goes. They, they just they just grow in their journey by being with other Christians. Now, I want to ask you, as I close and give you just a couple uh, final concluding remarks, I want to ask you this question. Um, which one or two of these different pathways do you find is, uh, is kind of major in your life? I, I would call them primary pathways. I'm going to go through them, and if this is one of the things that really helps you connect with God, I want you to raise your hand, good and high, all right? Number one is music, okay? Number two, nature. Number three, ritual. 
See, not, not much of that in Protestant circles. And I do think that there are symbols. We've got to be careful they don't become idols. But I do think there are symbols like candles and different things like that. One of the things that has meant the most to me on our Africa trips was when we washed the feet of some of the native people. I'll never forget it. Never forget the, the crusty soles of their feet. Um, ritual has its place. Solitude. How many of you connect with God through solitude? Um, service. How many of you connect with God most through serving others? Uh, study. Deep study of God's word. And the last one is through relationships. <laughs> I read this quote. It's in, it's in one of the things I read in preparing for this. And it's, it's a... It's a person who's very relational talking about solitude, and he says, he says this. Solitude wouldn't be so bad if I could just bring a bunch of friends along with me. <laughs> I, I like that. Okay, here's, here's some concluding remarks, and I'd like you to write these down if you, if you are inclined to do that. Uh, but this just kind of wraps it all up. Number one, identifying and practicing your primary pathway or pathways will help you grow spiritually. Now, if you have identified today that there's a primary pathway that seems to be what really helps you connect with God, then by all means, keep practicing it. Number two, your primary pathway is likely related to your personality and temperament. My guess is that those of you who love solitude and connect with God in solitude, that this is not categorical, but my guess is that you are kind of a contemplative kind of person, maybe a little bit introspective, and that's okay. Number three, during certain seasons of life, your primary pathway may change. One of the things I was reading this past week talked of a, a woman who, if I remember the story right, lost her husband and went through such grief. Her primary pathway was through studying the Word of God, but she found that during the, the months and extended period of her grief that she just almost couldn't read the Bible. And I'm not, I'm not telling you it's a good thing to lay the Bible aside, but I am saying that during, during certain seasons of life when you are facing um, really hard times or when things change, your primary pathway may change a little bit. You may come back to what your primary pathway is, but during certain seasons of life, you may find it very difficult to pray. Just, just take that for what it's worth, because I, I think that does happen in people's lives. And lastly, none of these pathways is exclusive. None of these pathways is exclusive. Let me elaborate on that a little bit. While you have a primary pathway, let's say it's music, you should experiment with others to stay balanced in your path to spiritual maturity. You may say, oh, my pathway is solitude, and I will always learn from God, grow in God through solitude. Well, that may be your primary pathway, but if you aren't learning and growing through contact with other believers, you're missing something. And let me also say, by way of uh, disclaimer, that I am not saying in any of these pathways that, that prayer or the Word of God should be neglected. I think the prayer and the Word of God should be uh, a, a vital part of all of these different pathways. It's just that some of these are additives that kind of give us a boost. They're vitamins that, that encourage us and help us in building our pathway to God.
Are you all with me? Okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, uh, for what you teach us. Help us to put it into practice. Help us not to just identify our pathway, but help us to take advantage of every opportunity we have to grow in you through the ways in which you've wired us to understand you and to know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand, worship team, come and lead us in a closing song. on the lights, I want to give you an assignment before you leave this place, all right? I want you to find two people, two people, and I want you to say to them, I see the beauty of Jesus in you, okay? Now, that may not be everybody that you shake hands with, but you don't have to make a big deal of that. Just somewhere along the line, say, I see the beauty of Jesus in you. Will you do that? Go. Have a great day.